expect a jump. All right, welcome back. Powers on Sports Podcast. Appreciate you finding us. Hopefully you enjoyed, uh, gave you some nuggets and some tidbits as you head into your NCAA tournament bracket and your weekend full of hoops, hoops, and more hoops. But now we are going to be joined by Mr. Mike Grace. Mike is the host of the Press Box Radio Show based out of Atlanta. Mike's been kind enough to allow me to be a part of his show a little bit from time to time. And so we're going to talk to Mike about uh, Mike's really uh, entrenched, talks a lot of SEC on his radio show. So we're going to talk about the Alabama situation. Mike's a huge baseball fan. Mike's a play-by-play uh, guy in his past. So we're going to talk to Mike all about all things broadcasting and a little sports of the day. So welcome in, Mike Grace. First of all, just great to, to return the favor, man. You have been such a big friend to, to, to our show, The Press Box, which you can find online anytime, pressboxradio.com. I'll throw that plug out there and get it yeah. out of the way. But really do appreciate all the all the time and, and effort and energy and talent that you brought to the press box. And it's been great having you as a part of the show. And so it's great to return the favor, man. Yeah, I appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. Mike's, uh, if you don't know, uh, Mike's had a long storied career in the broadcasting world. He was the voice of the Samford Bull, Bulldogs, which is a school, not Stanford, Samford <laughs> in Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama, a place that I, I've known Mike. I've known, heard Mike call many, many games in, uh, at Samford over the years when I lived in Birmingham. So Mike's done a, had a great, great career. And now he's uh, obviously hosting uh, the Press Box Radio and does a lot of freelance stuff. He does – tell me the bowl game. What's the bowl game you do? The well, college we, football. We, yeah, we do the Lending Tree Bowl down in Mobile. I've been in part of that uh, for all – I just finished up my 22nd year wow. as the uh, play-by-play voice for the Lending Tree Bowl. What has been the uh, Dollar General Bowl, the GoDaddy Bowl, the GMAC Bowl, et cetera. Uh, been a great, great uh, history of that bowl game down in Mobile, and the guys who run it have been kind enough to to, to keep me a part of it, and it's just a pleasure to do that uh, every year. I actually got to do in my freelance years, just the last couple of years, I did your Blazers a bunch, man. I did both radio and TV okay. for your Blazers over the years, which is always fun. I changed Very my cool. uh, colors from red and blue, Sanford red and blue, to uh, <laughs> maybe green and gold and enjoyed it thoroughly, man. So, yeah, I always enjoyed that. How, did you guys, when you were at Sanford, did you guys ever make the NCAA tournament, the men's side? We did not on the men's. I did do a pair of NCAA women's tournament games okay. for Sanford women's team that won the SOCON tournament a couple of times. The men never got to go to the big dance under uh, during my 10 years. We did play in the CBI one year. Yep, I yep. got to host a game in the CBI, but that was it. But, uh, you know, that's a Sanford program that really was kind of uh, tough days during, during my time there, but they're much better now. Uh, Bucky McMillan, who's a, a longtime yep. high school coach in the Birmingham area, made Mountain Brook a powerhouse uh, in in that community. He's been hired by uh, Martin Newton, the athletic director at Sanford, and uh, they won the SoCon regular season this year, did get upset in the tournament, so they didn't make the dance. But uh, they're they're on the rise. That, that's a that's a program to look for in the, in the Southern Conference. This I'm Sanford. pretty sure I was. I know I was in the building, and I'm you, I'm pretty sure you were there when Steph Curry, his senior year at Davidson, came through Samford, that magical run by by Davidson. Just talk about was he the best player you ever saw in the oh, SoCon? Without a doubt, and I and I got to see him for several years as as he worked for for Davidson, and was just a I mean, just a freak man. He was so good. Here's the thing though. Sanford nearly beat them. They had Sanford had a three at the buzzer. I remember that, that game that that would have tied the game and sent it to overtime. But yeah, Davidson escaped with a with a three point win. It's the only sellout in the history of that building. The Pete Hanna Center, which seats five thousand, went full. It's the only sellout in in the 10, 12 year history of that building, and it was worth it that day because uh, Steph 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 Curry certainly put on a show with the Davidson Wildcats. Yeah, how did you get into broadcasting? Tell me your kind of your career journey and how how you got into doing what you do. Well, man, I loved the radio ever since I could turn one on. And and as a kid, I'm a little older than you, Jason. I was born in 60, 61, so I am 61. Uh, and, and it was music radio that, that that fascinated me as a kid, so I wanted to be a DJ. And I got the chance to do that as a uh, the summer between my sophomore and junior year in high school. After just hanging around the local radio stations in Vicksburg, Mississippi, I got a guy to hire me. And I got to do, uh, I literally worked a five-hour shift, 5 p.m. to 10 p.m., uh, seven days a week for, wow. for two years to get to do that, but loved it, had a blast doing it. Um, and it, it just led me to a, to a career elsewhere. I worked uh, in Starkville, Mississippi, uh, while I was going to Mississippi state university there for a while, and then just did that. And it's, it's a funny thing. I was never smart enough to put sports radio together, which didn't exist when, when, when right. I was, I mean, there was no such thing as sports radio. Yes, there was sports play by play, but I thought, man, there, those jobs are so few and far between. I never, I was never smart enough to put my love of sports 
and my love of radio together, it happened crazy. I was doing mornings for a rock station in Mobile in the, in the year 2000 and or actually 1995, pardon me, uh, in 95. And my program director came to me and said, you're a sports guy, right? You like sports? I said, sure. He said, well, Monday we're changing formats. We're going to be the first FM sports talk station in the country. Wow. And we did WNSP 1055 in Mobile, Alabama was the first uh, FM sports talk show or sports talk radio station. And I did mornings for them for five years, served as their operations director, got the chance to do my first real play-by-play as a part of that crew doing uh, high school games and stuff like that. And that's kind of what started my, my sports career. I left them in 2000, formed my own uh, production company and have been freelancing ever since with that 10 year stint in, in Sanford thrown in there. But it's just something I've always loved, man. Radio to me was, uh, um, you know, it was the, it was the magic of closing your eyes and picturing yourself. That's the way I grew up, man, especially watching sports. Um, we got one at the, again, I, I'm going to sound so old when I do this, but it's the truth. We got one game a week, Saturday true. afternoon. It's true. Was I it? remember, that. I remember NBC, used to yeah. be NBC baseball game of the week or Monday it. night football. That was about it. So I would sit in my bedroom on a Saturday night as a, as a 10, 12, even 14 year old and just scan the AM dial listening for uh, Cardinals games on KMOX. Right. Uh, I, I could get WLS out of new Orleans uh, or not WS. Uh, oh gosh. W uh, WWL. That's what it was. Yes. Uh, WWL in new Orleans and listen to games there. Um, listening to Jack crystal do Mississippi state games. A guy named I uh, drew up in Vicksburg, Mississippi, a guy named Stan Torgerson was the old Ole Miss uh, play-by-play guy at the time. Um, and, and so, yeah, I just, I, I listened to that. It was the theater of the mind and the chance to do that, uh, full-time, uh, man, I've had a really, <laughs> a really blessed career in that regard, getting to do something I love to do pretty much every day. Yeah. Well, the show you're doing now, Press Box Radio, you're based right there in the middle of SEC country. You do the show out of Atlanta, but you got affiliates all over the Southeast and Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee. So, uh, you talk, we talk a lot of, uh, SEC stuff and throughout the year, Talk to me about. Um, I know you have a, a give give the, if you, those of the audience that don't know the the details. Obviously, the Brandon Miller situation in Alabama. He wasn't involved directly in the uh, the, the homicide that resulted in a young lady passing away. There's been some it, nuggets that have come out that did he drive the the car with the weapon in it to the guys who actually did the allegedly did the uh, the shooting. Just talk about the. the how you thought, I know you've had a strong opinion of how you thought Alabama's handled that situation. You know, I know it kind of, it was, it, it came up two months ago. It kind of went quiet for about a month or so. And then about three weeks ago or so, it really came back into the, into the forefront when uh, the grand jury got together. Yeah. So give the audience a little perspective of how you think Alabama's handled that situation in general. Well, the, the first thing I would say about this is, is this is one of those situations, especially uh, Jason, where facts count, man. I mean, facts matter in in a, in a situation like this. And when the original incident occurred uh, on the Strip, an area in Tuscaloosa, uh, home of the Alabama uh, University of Alabama, uh, not far from campus, as a matter of fact, where right. students hang out. Uh, again, it's called the Strip. And there was an incident there where uh, Darius Miles, who was a member of the Alabama basketball team, was involved with an, a childhood friend of his uh, in downtown uh, Tuscaloosa in a shooting that took the life. Uh, of a young lady, um, I think 20 years old, Jamia Harris was her name, uh, mother of a five-year-old. She lost her life in, in a shooting that took place there in, in Tuscaloosa. Uh, we knew originally that Darius Miles was involved. He was immediately uh, suspended from the university and kicked off the Alabama basketball team. Right. And at the time, that's all we knew. Uh, we were told by head coach Nate Oates, by athletic director Greg Byrne, and everyone involved with the University of Alabama, that that was it. That was the involvement. All of their players have been talked to. They've all been cooperating with authorities, and that was that. And uh, they 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 handled it by dismissing Darius Miles from the team, and that was that. As you mentioned, we had a preliminary hearing a month or so later that brought out some brand-new testimony when a Tuscaloosa City detective testified that the gun used in the murder, and it wasn't Darius Miles, by the way, the former Bama player who pulled the trigger. It was his childhood friend who did so, but it was Darius Miles' gun. And we learned in the testimony that day that the gun was transported to the scene in the back seat of Brandon Miller's car. Now, uh, his his attorney came out, Miller's attorney came out quickly and said, "Look, Brandon didn't even know the gun was there." Okay, and and that can be debated. We can go back and forth on that. But the the best evidence that that's true is the fact that Brandon Miller has not been charged with anything 
right. by Tuscaloosa police, by by the, the district attorney that has brought murder fi- uh, murder charges against Darius Miles and his childhood friends. So no charges against against Brandon Miller. So I'm I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. But in the next couple of days, it, it, it was it was terrible on the day that this happened. Uh, uh, media met with head coach Nate Oates following a regular practice, his regular midweek press conference. He's asked about the new information. And 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 all we know is that he says, um, yeah, it's a sad situation. Brandon Miller, basically wrong place, wrong time. That was the essence of his of his response. Well, we find very out flippant, next, very flippant very about flippant. how his response. Yeah. And, and obviously the national media went nuts and even the local media did. Well, we find out the next day when Greg Byrne, the director of athletics, appears on the Paul Feinbaum show, I think it was. Yeah where he says now that, hey, we learned new information yesterday and that, look, Coach Oates misspoke, misspoke because he wasn't aware of the testimony that came out the day before. Right. Well, that's fine, but he- here's my issue again, and I'm not throwing Brandon Miller under the bus. I have no reason to believe that this guy is guilty of anything other than, again, you know, maybe associating with with some some folks he maybe shouldn't have associated with. But, again, it was a teammate at the time. Right. But here's the, I really do have a problem. Greg Byrne came out that day, uh, the day after the trial, and said, we learned some new facts that day. So apparently they didn't know all that there was to know uh, a month earlier. Uh, they didn't know. Th- and, and, and it would have been so easy at the time to say, look, even if you didn't want to name him by name, to say, look, the, the authorities have identified two more of our players, because there was, it wasn't just Brandon Miller. It's also Jaden Bradley, another member of the, of, the, of the Bama team. Right. There are two teammates who were involved, but we are told by authorities are witnesses only. And and for that reason, we're going to keep their their uh, identity anonymous. And, right. and that would have been fine. We wouldn't have had to know who it was, but tell us at the beginning that there were two other players involved. You didn't tell us that. You right. told us that was it. Darius Miles was the only guy involved and everything else was fine. Well, that wasn't the truth, fellas. And so you blew it originally. You blew it when Nate Oates said, uh, you know, yeah, wrong place, wrong time. You blew it the next day when you told us that you learned information today during trial that you didn't know before. Right. I was just very, 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 very disappointed with the way the University of Alabama, the way Greg Byrne is athletic director, and the way Nate Oates as head coach handled and are still handling the situation. And I've I've thrown some some pointed some fingers well at, at, at national media, even Greg Gumbel, who this past Sunday afternoon on the selection show. How did he phrase it? He was, uh, oh gosh, you'll have to help me remember how he phrased it. It was, it was a weird he criminal, was a, criminal allegation yeah, or criminal he was involved in some criminal activity. Yeah, of which no charges were brought, and now they're the number one seed in the, in the national tournament. That that was it. That was all Greg Gumbel said right. about the issue. And my point is, if you're going to address it, then you need to address it in detail. You can't just throw that out there. Yes, he was involved in criminal activity. Um, not to where charges were brought against him, but I just thought Alabama as a whole, from a PR standpoint, could have managed this a whole lot better than they did. And we're in a position now, Jason, where just wait. Uh, I'm not sure when this podcast will air, but but when we're talking, there's an upcoming press conference. Nate Oates is going to meet the media today. Yes, Wednesday. We're, we're, we're doing yeah. this Wednesday morning. So, so Nate Oates is going to talk to the press later today, ahead of their or behind their practice uh, prior to uh, tomorrow's NCAA tournament opener for the Crimson Tide. And you know he's going to be asked about it. You know the national media is going to be here. They haven't been basically in the in the regular press conferences the last couple of months. Right. They'll be here today, and they're going to ask Brandon Miller if, if he appears before the media, and certainly Nate Oates, the head coach, about it. And I'm really interested to see what the answer is going to be. Look, it's not going to be much. The one time Brandon Miller did meet with the media last week ahead of the SEC tournament, I thought he spoke quite eloquently. He basically said it, it's a horrible tragedy. We cannot lose side of the fact that that, right. that the young person lost their life and a family is suffering because of that. And respectfully, that's about all I can say. And and that that's that's as eloquent as you can be in a situation like that. So I don't expect anything more from Nate Oates and or Brandon Miller, but I hope that what they do say is well thought out, is planned. Um, they shouldn't be caught off guard by this the way yeah. they were time and time and time again in the early part of this story. And the other part of this story that kind of has bothered a lot of people around the country is that Brandon Miller hasn't missed one minute of time. Not one been, minute. I mean, not, I mean, and again, not that you have to kick him off the team if he didn't do anything wrong, but most of the time 
bad judgment, a bad, you know, some kind of penalty for, for putting yourself in a bad spot. And, and that could have been done so easily at the beginning. Yes. When you suspend him for two games, uh, something right. along those lines, you do it at the beginning and, and, and look, by doing so, you would have obviously given up his identity, which I, I don't think that's a, that's a, that would have been a big deal. You say, look, he was involved, but strictly as a witness, right. But because he was in the area, because he was out past curfew, because I got it. This happened at 1240 or, or one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I've got to believe this. And this was after they had just beaten LSU at Coleman Coliseum in Tuscaloosa by 40 that afternoon. Right. So I think you could have afforded to sit the young man for a couple of games, get it out of the way. And and that would have been that. Uh, the, the information we would have learned when the preliminary hearing did occur a, a month later would have been new revelation as regards to how the the, the gun got there in the backseat right. of Brandon Miller's car. But some discipline regarding Brandon Miller would have already taken place. As it is now, zero discipline has been has been issued to Brandon Miller, and they can't do it now. If they right. do it now, you can't. Then, yeah, they're not doing they, it. Yeah, now. yeah, they're not doing it now. They, they even when when they uh, had the chance uh, the second time around, well, again after the preliminary hearing, if they did it then, well, then they're admitting they made a mistake by not doing it earlier. Right. So, just the, from a PR standpoint. This this has been an absolute nightmare for Alabama in the way they've handled it, and uh, it, it will continue to be as as long as Alabama is still playing in the in the tournament. Yeah, and, and Miller is is obviously a first team All American, the first ever Alabama player to be named, be named first team All American ever in the history of the program. He was the SEC MVP. I mean, no doubt he'll be a top five NBA draft pick after this year. But and again, the other part of this conversation is. If he was the sixth guy off the bench, would he have been on the team or would they have done something different two months ago? We never – who knows? Well, Jason, I think you were here for my diatribe the day I said uh, I, I I addressed Nate Oates on this yep. radio program and Greg Byrne, the athletic director, who I don't know. They, they've both been on the show in, in the past. You know, I started the show uh, – my partners were J.D. Byers, who is the longtime radio voice for the Jaguars of South Alabama, and Chris Stewart, longtime right. voice of the Crimson right. Tide. I think he's in his 22nd year as the voice of Alabama basketball, we started the show with them. And because of that, we've had, we've had those guys on the radio program and they've been great. And that's been fantastic. But, but I, I said again, and really addressing Nate Oates regarding his basketball team, you got everything, man, a basketball team could ask for. These guys have got talent. They've got depth. They've got inside presence. They've got outside presence. They play defense like crazy. They've got everything it takes to win a national championship, except one thing. And that one thing is class. And, and they have had chances to show it. And they just, again, he had a technical foul called on him in the final two minutes of a SEC tournament championship game that he's leading by 20 points. Yeah. Bad look. Sit down and watch the game and, and win with a little class. Right. How hard is that to do? Right. And people people jumped at me and said, oh, Mike, if, if Bama was your team, you'd be okay with it. And I say, no, I wouldn't. My baseball team is the Braves from Atlanta, okay? And two years ago, they won the World Series, and they did it with class. Right. You can say what you want to about Jorge Soler standing at home plate and watching his ball leave the the park, but when you hit it out of the stadium, you get it. <laughs> you you have the right to sit there and watch it. Okay. Right. I just thought what what Atlanta did, they did so with class. They did so as a team. Right. They gave you know everybody was giving credit to the other guys. I don't sense that. I don't sense that from this Alabama team. And look, they are going to be. It's one thing they're playing in Birmingham this weekend, and that's fantastic. And you would you would think they're certainly favored to go all the way through and get to the round of Sweet 16 uh, for the second time in Nate Oates' tenure, as a matter right, of fact. Right. Uh, but don't make any mistake. When they leave Birmingham, yep. they it's will, game on. Not, they game will on. not be a fan favorite. The crowds they play in front of following this weekend will not be on Alabama's side. And yeah. you're on social media. You saw some interesting pictures of some people with some T-shirts at the SEC tournament oh. relating to Brandon oh. Miller's situation and some comments Look, that, and some, yeah. That that's as classless. Yep. As classless gets. And if you missed it, the the, the front of the shirt was great. The front of the shirt said goats, G O A T S, and the yep. A was the Alabama script. That's yep. fantastic. Yep. The back of the shirt said literally, guys, this is no joke. Yep. Killing our way through the SEC in 23. I mean, crazy, man. That's on the back of your shirt. You walk into an SEC tournament game, and you're approached by a, a couple of different media members to say, you know, just ask you about the, the shirt, and your response to them is, get the F out of my face. Oh my that, that's how you respond to them. 
and and look, that, I'm not talking for the entire Bama fan base. Okay, right. I understand there are some sane Bama fans out there, and tons of them, and a lot of them are my friends. Yeah, and one of them again, Chris Stewart, voice of the Crimson Tide. Yep. Love listening to Chris call the Tide games. Okay, he does it as a Bama fan, and I got no problem with that. He's paid for. He's he's paid by the Crimson Tide Sports Network. Okay, yep. Yep. So I got yep. no problem with him being for the Crimson Tide. Uh, but boy, howdy! If you're a fan, you just can't, you just can't act like that. So there's a lot of things about this Bama team that I don't like. There's a lot of things about this Bama team that I think the country won't like. And when they get out of Birmingham, they're going to hear it. So. You're right about that. You're right. All right, we'll, we'll get off the Alabama. We'll, give me. We're going to a couple uh, SEC tournament bracket tidbits. Woo. Outside of Alabama, who do you like? Who do you think could win a couple games? But you know, you got a lot of mid-level seeds, six, seven, eight seeds. You got Kentucky, you got Arkansas, you got, you know, Auburn is a nine seed playing in Birmingham. Give me a couple of teams that you think in the SEC that could win a couple games. Well, look, let's kind of run through this. Tennessee is a four seed in the East. This is a team that up until the last couple of weeks of the regular season was thought to maybe be a two seed. Right. Uh, but they lose the Kai Ziegler, their point guard. And let's face it, Rick Barnes is still trying to figure out how to play without his point guard, understandably so. Um, they draw a really good Louisiana team, Sunbelt Conference champions in a 4-13 matchup. Yeah. If Tennessee manages to get by them, I don't see them going much further than that. I don't, they got I don't Duke think, in round two. Yeah, I, I don't think Tennessee makes the Sweet 16. I don't. Kentucky as a six seed, another very iffy team. So young. Uh, Coach Calipari has been fantastic. But, again, this is a team that's very young. They get an 11-seed Providence team that a lot of folks are picking. I don't think the Cats can win more than maybe one game at best. Texas A&M, probably under at seven yeah. in the Midwest. They get a Thursday night game against the 10-seed Penn State. I don't know a lot about Penn State, but I hear folks talk, and they like the Nittany, Nittany Lions. And so we'll see. I think Buzz Williams, though, uh, he's got a he's got a he's got a chip on chip his shoulder. On it, I agree. I think they're going to beat Penn State, and and I think so too. I, I would I would take Texas A and M maybe even to make the Sweet Sixteen. And that would real quick that would set up a second round matchup with the bitter rivals of the Longhorns of Texas potentially an A and M Texas second round matchup. But that's just a coincidence. Yeah, the, I know. The, the, the committee just... doesn't work on it. Doesn't look at that when they're putting no. these brackets together. Strictly no. a coincidence. Um, that would love that. Texas A&M and Texas. And look, Texas is one of those teams, again, I, I think can win it all. There's only a handful I think they can win it, but Texas is one of them. So that that may be where the Texas A&M run ends. For Missouri, they're such a great story. A first-year head coach in Dennis Gates, yep. who is the coolest customer Yes, the building, man. He's just so cool and calm and collected. His team plays lights out for him. They get a 10-seed Utah State, one of the last teams in yep. uh, to make the field. Um, Missouri, I think, could win a game or two, but everybody's dark horse in in the SEC is Arkansas, and I would have to agree with them. I think the toughest road is going to be the opening game. The nine seed Illinois will not be an easy easy matchup for them on Thursday afternoon. But Eric Musselman's got some real talent. They got the key pieces of their offense back late in the year. Yeah, um, you know the the the, the freshman All American Nick Smith. Uh, that's the guy who didn't play until the last two weeks of the regular season. Right. And now he's feeling it. He's in, in you know, a, a regular member of the rotation now. I think Arkansas could probably do the most damage. Uh, we I, I didn't mention Auburn. We, we've skipped Auburn. I think it's going to be a tough road for Auburn. I love Bruce Pearl. I love what he's done with that program. I'm just not sure he's got – the man they got the break of all breaks getting to play an hour and a half down the road in Birmingham against potentially Houston in round two. So, oh, it's going to be it's going to be the jungle in Birmingham for Auburn. I don't think there's any doubt about that. But there again, I'm just not sure he has the manpower yep. uh, to get to get past to Iowa in the opening round on Thursday. Hope so, because it would set up a great matchup, you would think, with Houston uh, right. on Saturday, which would be terrific. And for Alabama, I, I I think this is the year Alabama's going to have to beat themselves. I do think there's a couple of teams that could get them for the national title, Yeah, uh, perhaps keep them out of it. Our buddy, uh, we were talking to Pete Gillen, the CBS yeah. sports uh, uh, analyst earlier in the year, guy who coached, I think, 22 seasons at the D1 level. Yep. He picked Marquette to knock off Bama in the semis. Yep. I think it could be that, or it could be Texas in the national championship game. If it were me, I, I would say Bama makes the Final Four but does not win the national championship. Great insight from Mike Grace, host of the Press Box Radio Show. 
uh, pre- what, what is the app? The Press Box Radio app, right? Yeah, you it is. Yeah, just search the Press Box in the Apple or Google Play stores. Just that simple. And online, it's pressboxradio.com. All right, we're gonna before we're gonna let Mike go. We're gonna ask him a couple more things. We're gonna ask, he's a big baseball guy. We're I know he's a big Braves fan. We're gonna ask. I want, I want to get your thoughts on the new some of the new baseball rules, the pitch clock, the size of the bases, the shifting. Which one of those three do you like the most, and which one do you like the least? Well, I'm trying not to laugh when you mention this because it just it just blows me away that we're making the most dramatic changes that have ever been made to the game of baseball to try to attract a handful of fans who think they would watch more if the games were a little shorter. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 just, I think it's much ado about nothing. I think the pitch clock and, and is going to be interesting. I, I will adjust to it. We adjusted to the DH and the national league. That's right. We, we adjusted to interleague play. We'll, we'll adjust to it. It'll be fine, but it'll be weird in, in, in the early going and wait till, you know, we saw the very first game the Braves played in, in That's spring right. training and on a, on a on a batter's violation, him him called out in the batter's box for not being ready for the pitch. The first time that happens in in the regular season, the first time it happens in the postseason. That's right. Oh boy, it's gonna be it's gonna be something else. The shift is something that look. I'm I'm picking the Braves, Matt Olson, to be the National League most valuable player. He uh, he he and Freddie Freeman are a lock man with the with the two hole now open for them right. or the four hole. Pardon me. Uh, that that part on the right side with the second baseman no longer there, they're going to eat that up. Uh, I think the first day in, in spring training, uh, Matt Olson had three singles all to the right side <laughs> right. of the infield. Going to tear that up. Uh, so I'm I'm okay with it. But again, I I think we're blowing up the game. You know why why can't why can't you defend the way you want to defend as a as right. a defensive coach? It's the other thing that I miss about the designated hitter. I understand not wanting to watch a pitcher hit. But I love the strategy that was involved in a manager's decision to leave a guy in or to take him out. I'm for I'm for now tying it to the DH, okay, and, and your starting pitcher. If you if you pull your starting pitcher, then you lose your DH. Okay. Again, that would bring back a little more of that strategy and decision making for the head coach as to whether I pull my pitcher here or not, um, and and whether I let my this DH go in and bat. So I, I miss that strategy part of it. And the bases, I don't know. Again, we opened this this podcast by talking about how old I am, man. I remember Lou Brock and and uh, Vince and Coleman guys, and Ricky Henderson yeah, stealing a hundred bases a year. Okay, somebody's going to do that this year. Th- I don't think there's any doubt somebody's going to do that. When I think the leading base stealer last year was maybe forty something. Yeah, right. I think in the forties. Yep. Yeah. So you're going to have somebody steal a hundred bases this year. Count on it, man. Interesting. What do you what, give us? A quick synopsis of the Braves. I know that's a team you follow pretty closely. Um, really, really surprised by the Sean Murphy deal in the off season, but I like it. Um, he and Travis Darno, I think will make a, a fantastic combo. Uh, Darno and, and Contreras were great, but certainly Sean Murphy is an upgrade there. I'm not all that concerned. Look, I hate that they, they lost Dansby. I really am just from a fan standpoint, he and yep. Freddie Freeman to lose them in back-to-back seasons is really hard, but there again, we'll adjust. We live without Freddie. Uh, it was emotional when he came back, but we live without him. We'll live without Dansby, and we'll pull for him when he's not playing against the Braves. But when he comes back to Truist Park, <laughs> we're going to be booing him, okay? It's just the way it is. Um, we love you, Dansby, until you come up here in those in those Chicago pinstripe, and, and then we don't, we don't uh, love you as much anymore. Um, I think Vaughn Grissom will be fine at shortstop. I think he'll be fine defensively. He's working with a guy named Ron Washington, who is the yep. – I mean, come on, he is the – uh, infield whisperer. guru. Oh yeah, he's the infield whisperer when it comes to guys like that. I think that I think the Braves are going to be better this year than they were last year. Look, they had such a magical season when they won the whole thing, but I think they're going to be better with a healthy Ronald Acuna Jr. back, a healthy Ozzy Albies back, a a uh, Austin Riley who should tear things up again at third base. Left field is a bit of a concern, but you see what Marcelo Ozuna did yesterday? I did. Ozuna had two or three hits, a couple of doubles as well. I think he's hitting around the 300 mark in spring training. If Ozuna could give us any kind of production like that out of left field, I think they'll be fine. I think Matt Olson really is a legitimate MVP candidate at first base. Uh, but the problem with is, is the NL East, man. What yeah, the Mets the have Mets, done, what the Phillies yeah. have done, it is an absolutely loaded, uh, absolutely loaded division. But I think I saw this note. You'll have to go back and check on me. I think the Mets. Hang on, I got to find the right. I want to make sure I get the right stat on this. I don't. I don't want to mess this up. 
And it's don't about- let Mike Soroka come back and be a force on the pitching staff. Who's, you know, he was off. His trajectory was tremendous before he hurt his Achilles a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, the, the pitching is going to be interesting. Max Fried will be fantastic. Uh, we'll see. I mean, look, Ian Anderson just today, Ian Anderson and Bryce Elder sent down to triple A. All that. So it won't be them probably as our fifth starter for the Braves. In order to catch the Braves in division titles since joining in 1994, the Mets would need to need a win the National League East every year from now until 2037. <laughs> so Mets, take that and have fun with it. Um, I, I, I like the Braves to at least compete for the National League East, hopefully win it again for what would be, what, I guess the fifth straight year. Yeah. Uh, and 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 compete for a chance. Let's let's bring another World Series trophy back to Truist Park, who, by the way, piled in 3.1 million fans a year right. ago. I think they're expected to do that. They've already cut off season ticket sales because give the audience a sense of that park. I've never been there. Is it a it's a new park in the last four or five years? Talk about the park a little bit, real quick. The, 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 the park itself is great. It, it, it's 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 forty thousand, maybe a little less than forty thousand is what it seats. But it's not just the stadium, it's what they did. And this is the new thing in Major League Baseball, and it's it's huge for a number of reasons for the Braves. It's not just the stadium, it's the area around it called the Battery, that all the, the real estate, all the land is owned by the Atlanta Braves Baseball Club. So they're getting revenue now from leasing those properties, that space, 12 months out of the year, okay? So revenue is coming in 12 months out of the year, and that's a, that's a big thing for Atlanta, especially – with what's going on with the RSNs, the Bally Sports bankruptcy and all right, that jazz. Right. Um, I think the Braves are one of the few teams that actually make money for Bally uh, through their television things. There are a number of them. I think I saw the Guardians in Cleveland, the Reds in Cincinnati, the Padres in, in San Diego, and maybe one of the franchise, can't remember, who Bally's just losing their shirt doing those, those broadcasts. And so yep. with this bankruptcy, I would expect those franchises to have some trouble with their TV in the future. I think we're going to be okay as far as the Braves go. But, yeah, that that park is fantastic. And, again, don't just come for the game. Come for uh, lunch beforehand. Stay for dinner afterwards. It's a fantastic entertainment complex with all kinds of stores and restaurants and bars and really cool things. And this is a, a really neat place to, to enjoy a baseball game. we got to get you up from Tampa. I, I, have a, I have a limited season ticket package. i got 27 games. Uh, for the season, you so got it. Summer Tampa. trip. We'll make a little I'll, summer I'll, summer I'll, weekend. I will. I would love to uh, treat you to a, to an afternoon or evening at Truist Park, my friend. I I will take you up on that. I'll give a shout out to my buddy Chuck DJ DJ Chuck J. He's a he's a DJ in Battery Park for the Braves games. He does yeah. a lot of home game stuff. So give out a shout out to my guy Chuck. Awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right, Mike Grace. Well, I appreciate it. And by, by the way, Mike Grace is a one bracket guy. One bracket's all you do, Thank right? You. That's one bracket. Come on. You can't do seven brackets. So <laughs> you get one bracket, one bracket, one bracket. All right. Last thing I'll get you out of here. I give you full permission today on Wednesday. Your Mississippi State Bulldog season is over. You can go have your favorite dessert for lunch today. Okay. Yeah. Get a yeah bit, whatever yeah, ice cream, cherry pie, mm-hmm. whatever it is you like. You can have yep, a, yep. one big portion now that your bulldog season's over. Okay. I got, I got a, I got a brand new uh, bag of the Snickers minis. <laughs> that have been chilling overnight in the fridge. Just got to put them in the fridge, let them chill a little bit. So I'll I'll be eating my share of Snickers minis today, uh, trying to uh, soothe the pain of watching my Bulldogs go down last night. Yeah. Well, Mike Grace, host of the Press Box Radio Show, really appreciate it. Don't fire me before Easter. Let me at least get no to way. Easter before you fire me. <laughs> You're welcome great radio show Fox heard all around the time. southeast go find them online again eight to ten eastern time monday through friday seven to nine central time in alabama tennessee parts of georgia all that good stuff continue the great work man appreciate you let me be a part of what you're doing and we'll talk again real soon and we'll see you tomorrow in the press box on pressboxradio.com all right have a great week folks and we'll see you next time on the powers on sports podcast good luck with your bracket